So the agenda is, is primarily going to be around actually building great teams rather than thinking about necessarily just building uh, great games. Um, and I do want to make it as, as interactive as possible, so yeah, do let me know. Uh, shortly about me, I actually used to work for Google, so this whole AdWords interface craziness is something I'm very familiar with. Um, but on that, I've been spending most of my adult life playing games and eating pizza, and then at some point I also started becoming like, reasonably serious about business, and, um, and now work uh, as the VP of, well, effectively it's sales, but you don't want to say that when you work with developers, so I call it talking to people. Um, in the past three years, uh, I was part of founding Priori. In the past three years, I, th I think I spoke to around like a thousand game publishers and, 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 and app developers, and it's sort of on the basis in the back of that that I am uh, qualified in any capacity to say anything about this. Um, and I'll focus on like what the most successful of them have done differently than um, the ones we've seen fail. So just uh, briefly about us, and I can see the white is not a great color on this, uh, so I'll have to read some of it out. Um, we're based in Berlin. We're a small company uh, of 18 people, and we basically analyze the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. Um, and for every app in both stores and every game, we estimate a download and a revenue uh, a number that is uh, estimated on a daily basis. So we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on, not just with the individual apps, but also as you aggregate this information up to the publisher level and the category level, and we can start analyzing trends that go beyond sort of uh, just the individual app. As such, we are competing with App Annie that have now raised, uh, raised a total of $163 million, and we've raised three. So kind of, um, <laughs> kind of indie as well, uh, which puts us, in, I think, in a good position. Anyway, the way that we sort of uh, develop our business is actually by building partnerships. One of the partnerships that we build is with Newsu, um, and, and we sort of try to sort of combine our, our efforts to provide market data. And this is sort of the core, and this is the reason why we even can provide estimates. We partner with app developers and app publishers that share their data with us so that we can improve our estimates, and they get then uh, significantly discounted access to our platform. That's all about us. Now, what I want to do is I want to start out on a high note, start out with all the great stuff. And the good news is that you're in the right, like you think about this, you're in the right industry. So. We estimate, together in so that the, the mobile games market is gonna be around uh, $37 billion this year, uh, which is actually 37% of the global market for games, which is quite phenomenal, and it's growing still. So all good, you're in the, you're in the right industry. The other uh, sort of good news here is that the recipe for success in the app stores is pretty, is pretty simple, actually. So in, uh, in 2015, look at the whole year, Four in 1,000 new games made it into the top 100 free overall. This is looking at the US App Store, which is considered the most sort of valuable real estate in the app economy. So four in 1,000 new games made it in. One in 1,000 new games made it into the top 10 free overall. 63% of new games that made it into the top 10 were featured beforehand. 100% of these were featured on the iTunes front page. So Wait for it, growth hack number one, all you need to do is get featured on the Apple App Store US front page. That's it. All right, now unfortunately, it doesn't happen to everyone, newsflash. So uh, <laughs> what I wanna talk about like briefly now is the story of all the thousands and thousands of games that are tanking and not succeeding every single week. So um, I looked at some data. So in the week of October 11th to 17th, that was the most recent I could get given the timeline for submitting my presentation for Casual Connect. But in the week, uh, there were more than 15,000 new apps and games that were launched in Google Play and the Apple App Store in this week alone. 907 of these got more than 1,000 downloads globally. And you may not be sort of super familiar with like, what's a lot of downloads, but 1,000 downloads is not even that much, so it sort of says something about how hard it is. It means basically there are 14,000 companies out there that didn't really get what they wanted in that first week. Anyway, so I wanna give you an example of like what a really great game looks like. So this is a, 
Um, one of the indie games of the year last year, Story, Story Warriors Fairy Tales by Thumbstar Game. So maybe you can't see this, launched in July 2015, number four on Indie Gamers Reviewers top 10 list. It was sort of pulled into multiple different festivals and was generally quite hyped. And this is uh, how it performed. Uh, now you may not be able to see it, but we have like a, a trend line down here. And this is reasonably good, and this is like not, not great. Um, not great at all. So basically, it peaked at around a couple 300 downloads a day for less than a week. Then it tanked, and it has sort of tanked ever since, despite having what is like uh, going to be a really, really good product. Um, and this is a very, very general pattern in the app stores. And to understand why that is, we have to look at sort of the app store top charts. And if you think about the top charge, I, I still think it's a good, a good place to start if you want to sort of define a proxy for success in the app stores, looking at the top, top charts uh, rank. So getting into the app store top charts, meaning as a, this is what consumers see when they go to the, to the store, is not a problem. So there's around 100 new games every single day that receive a top chart position. New games come into the app store and actually get into the uh, top 100. 60% of them are free, uh, except in the US where there's typically more uh, paid games. But it's quite consistent through all the, throughout all the countries that we cover, around 100 new games every single day. The problem is remaining in the top charts. So this is uh, about top chart turnover, and you see that 50% of new free apps or games that are in and out of the charge within one day. So you spend 12 months building a game, you get into the App Store, it's pretty exciting, people are downloading it, and within one day, or as is the case with like 90% of apps within one week, you're out of the top charts forever in most cases. Um, it's particularly interesting given the fact that on Apple, you actually get an advantage when you launch your app. You, they let you rank higher in the keywords in the first week. And, and take that into consideration and see, look at this data, it, it's quite staggering. Um, the problem, obviously, is that there is no game or no app in the world that can really justify the years and months and hard work and labor by being in the top charts for just one week. So, and why is that? If you look at the app economy in general, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty phenomenal place, given how many companies are active in it. You have actually only 100 companies in the world that command around 70% of store downloads 60, might be even higher, maybe might be 70% today, of App Store revenue. And they're doing this by leveraging the portfolios. Think about the super sales that are cross-promoting their apps, Rovio, um, we're all well, well familiar with these companies. Whereas smaller developers often sort of like have zero market research done in advance and are basically taken by surprise. So actually when you, when you dive into that one week, why, why only one week? It's often because the developer had no idea what it took to be ranked in the charts, like how many downloads do we need to drive every single day to consistently be present in the App Store. So we have a completely skewed market, I think, basically. So the question is, I think, when, when you think about uh, developing games, and you're in the right industry, is do you want to build great games, or do you want, want to build a great business? And this is actually what I, what I meet a lot. I don't work, need the money, dear, I work for art. This is Maria Kalas, she also made a fortune. Um, but the quote is pretty sort of like strong and, and resonates well, at least to me, as having spoken to a lot of developers. This is a, <laughs> this is a this is, I'm, I'm going to read it out loud to you, but it's like, this is a, from an indie developer form um, I'm following on Facebook. It basically says, so my game is in the store. How do I get downloads? I didn't even implement in-app purchases yet, so it's like really free, and I can't get any traffic. And if you can't get any traffic, you also can't monetize, even if you do uh, uh, partner with Mongol. We have very, uh, great products, by the way. I will say that as an independent. Um, but this is like, quite consistent, right? So, and it, it kind of makes sense if you think about the industry and the history of, of making games, because it's a creative industry, which, by the way, is also the reason why people come to conferences. It's not to hear to me talk about, like, depressing industry trends. It's sort of <laughs> because games are cool and it's fun to work with games and game developers are generally also like really funny people. Um, and you also have to consider the fact that back in the days it was enough to just build a great game. It actually used to be enough. You build a great game, you put it in the storage, something exploded and all of a sudden you were like a millionaire. 
It doesn't quite work that way anymore, but it does mean that you have, we're dealing with an industry where business planning, benchmarking, KPI setting, et cetera, is still secondary, even in larger companies. So what I want to look at now is just how are our most successful partners that we've, we work with, how are they actually thinking about launching apps and growing their business, and how does that, that sort of set them apart from, from the companies that don't succeed? And, and, the, and the first point, and this is really the most, most important one, is they, they understand the value of a data and marketing wizard. And if you, if you think about that in the context of succeeding, this is from a quote from a, a friend of mine, Michael Velkas. It's actually from here, Israel. Today, without organic installs, app cannot stay above water. The only reason a mobile game player will invite his friends into an app today is if he needs his friends to join the game experience in order to continue playing and evolving. That indicates that not only do you need marketing people, you also need your product to have that component in it that will make people share it and that will make people actually um, help you grow your audience. So thinking about this means that the, the successful companies typically think about first and foremost building a great team rather than just a great product. They have to have like, the product, the market people in their team from the get-go. And rather than having a team of four great developers, which is like a very frequent pattern, you should have a team of one to two great developers and one to two great business people, marketing people. I would really highly recommend that. And actually then making sure that they have the power and the mandate to change your business and propel it forward. Two, they soft launch and test a lot. So, if you don't have a really well-functioning game when you enter, for instance, the US App Store, you are not going to survive in there. It's a very difficult market to compete in. So you need to have tested out your product in advance. And sort of one of the ways you can do that, I want to show you an example of a successful, what a successful soft launch looks like. This is one of our partners from uh, Mag Interactive, Word a Lot Picture Game. Now, what you absolutely cannot see at all right now, I'm really sorry about that. But <laughs> you'll see the colored lines here, they start sort of in progression. So for the first two weeks, they launched in Canada. Then they launched in Sweden, and then they launched in the US. It was sort of like a two week uh, period. Um, as they've been launching new countries, and over time, they've actually managed to grow and increase the revenue to uh, download ratio over time. I'll show you the numbers in a second. But you can see completely different pattern than what we saw for the indie games earlier, which is actually quite consistent growth. And this is if you look at the, the data. So after one month after, uh, after launch, they were looking at a download to revenue data. This is only App Store revenue, I have to say. So they grew it from 39 cent on the dollar after one month to 60 cent on the dollar after two months, and then 91 cent on the dollar today, uh, global launch. So for every single country they've launched, they've learned something, and they've improved their ability to monetize, which really characterizes the successful soft launch. They pay attention to the stores and their competition. This is pretty important, I think. This is something that I've never heard anyone consider. But actually, if you look at this, this is month-over-month uh, -month growth and increase of new submissions to the App Store. And you could say that it's probably a pretty bad idea to launch a new game around February, March, because that's what everyone else is doing. It's really something you want to do. You want to take into consideration. When do you want to, when do you want to, I think my ear is like really weirdly shaved because this keeps falling off. Anyway. So yeah. I'm 35, and today I realize that I'm a freak, um, apparently. Okay, th <laughs> all right, but anyway, take that into consideration. Another thing you want to take into consideration is the impact of global events. This is like, think about like the app stores as your local supermarket, you go in there. If there's like a hot Toblerone lady and boy out front like pushing Toblerone into you because they want to, they're like doing a promotional offer, the chance and likelihood of you buying Toblerone is higher. And the same thing goes with, uh, with large sports events. So this is uh, the World Cup a couple of years ago. Um, and this is what happened. Like, this is actually what happened with like, all the gaming categories immediately in the, when the World Cup launched. They completely tanked because nobody's downloading games when there's like, a huge football event going on. Or like, fewer people are downloading games. So again, like, take, 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 sports games. Yeah, that was, football games are doing really well. Well, good question. I didn't take sports games into consideration. This is arcade, puzzle, action, and strategy. Sports games are doing well. Uh, so, um, but again, like try to think about consumer demands as something that is like denoted by app downloads, and try to think about seasonality, looking at your competition, looking at major events, looking at when everyone else is launching, and see if you can find an opportunity there for, uh, for, uh, for launching your game that is better. 
Fourth, they identify new markets and set realistic benchmark. I think the realistic benchmark is the core component here. Um, so basically, this is, uh, this is, all of this is based on, on, on data that we provide. Um, so that would be the source. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you show an example of puzzle games for iOS and how you can sort of do this. Um, what you want to do is you want to look at the business model is free within a purchase. There are around 18,000 iOS puzzle games globally. And for this study, I'm going to focus on France, Germany, and, and Brazil with the goal of getting into top 10. So this is uh, an overview of the market. September, uh, in terms of downloads, revenues, and download ratio, you can see that Germany uh, and France are the larger markets, also in terms of revenues, whereas Brazil is an emerging market, significantly smaller. This is the revenue download ratio, again, in-app purchase versus download. So $1.08, uh, $0.97, uh, $0.97 cent and $0.28. Cents. Now, this is the total market. But what I want to do as a smaller developer is I want to sort of figure out what happens if I take out the top three players in each of the markets. The top three games are taken out. And what happens is so you'll see that, of course, Germany and France are still the larger markets. But the drop in France in terms of r revenue to the, to the download is insane. So 38% lower, which means that while France may look like a very attractive market, the problem is that actually the, the, the revenue is going to the top three players, which leaves us back with Germany, which you have 87 cent per dollar, and, and Brazil, which doesn't change too much in terms of uh, revenue, it's still very low. Now, the next thing I want to do is sort of trying to figure out that I get a broader scope. So what we're looking at before was September data. This is quarter over quarter data to give you sort of an understanding of like the general direction of the market. So again, you can see here, like the growth in terms of downloads and revenue would indicate that Germany is growing slower than France right now. And the Brazil has like a reasonably healthy growth in terms of the re relationship, again, uh, of revenues to downloads and, and revenue specifically. But we saw before that France is growing, but that it's on the basis of going to uh, the, where the revenue goes to the top three games. So the last piece of the puzzle here will be to assess the cost associated with achieving a top 10 spot. And for that, I'm, I'm pulling in some data from Chartboost that make their, their data available. So the cost of CPI uh, of, a, of an install is actually made available by Chartboost um, publicly. So effectively, what I did was I took daily downloads needed to reach a top 10 uh, on the last 30-day average. So in Germany, that's 1,430. In France, that's 480. In Brazil, it's 780. So, and then I'm assuming that we need to buy 50% of those and that we'll get an organic uplift on the top of that, which means I divide it by two. Then I multiply by the average CPI for puzzle games, and then that brings me to a cost per day. Again, like assuming I need to buy 50% of the installs needed to rank in top 10. So that was like $1,800 a day for Germany, $1,480 for France, and $351 for Brazil. So if I sum up, like basically look at this, you have the three different markets. You have Germany, where the, the largest download per uh, dollar per download, but slower growth in the last quarter, and the very, very high CPI. So you have France with solid revenue growth, quarter over quarter, but top market concentration. And then you have Brazil, which a uh, lower down, <laughs> dollar per download, but CPI levels that actually allow me, even me as a, an indie game developer, to, to compete. So, I'm going to set my mind on Brazil, seeing as I'm trying to speak to like, the, the audience that may not have billions and gazillions of dollars. I decide on Brazil. Now, a little further analysis uh, led me to understand that in Brazil, there are 45 iOS puzzle games that make more than $1 per download. And I have to assume that I can build a game that is equally successful. So I'm going to do that, which means that, again, like I had estimated downloads needed for a top 10, 780. Estimated cost per day, 351. Estimated revenue per download is one, which means I can actually start to understand how much revenue I would get. This is purely from App Store, uh, App Store revenue, 429 a day, which actually gives me a number to work with. This is actually a number that I can use in my forecasting. I can take it to my investors, and I can start sort of planning on the basis thereof. But at least I have some understanding of what it takes to succeed. This is, I have to skip through this reasonably quickly. I'm happy to talk to you after, of course. but. This is like one of the core components in this. And we found, actually, in the study that if you're able to answer the, some of the questions on the next slide, you are already likely to be growing three times faster than anyone else in the market. So effectively, the, the questions you need to be able to answer is like, they're, they're basic. What's the, what's the average lifetime value of our users? How well do we retain our users? 
What's our ideal app store top chart position? Uh, how are we performing relative to our peers over time? And how much does it cost for us to actually go global? And, and where's demand for our particular games growing? We find that companies that can answer these questions are succeeding. And companies that can answer these questions also consistently have someone dedicated to looking at this. And I mean, we're a data provider. There's plenty of ad tech companies out there that will help you as well with, with trying to understand how you can best grow your company. But you can't really do that unless you have someone who knows how to take that information and make that as relevant as possible to your business. And you can't have that without giving them the mandate and putting it in position and giving them the tools that they need to succeed. So that's my message to, to you today, is, is really try to invest in that component of your business, because then you can start leveraging all the amazing technologies and tools and, and services that are out there to grow in your game. And if not, uh, then maybe you should work for a larger company that does games as well, so you don't waste your talent. That's, uh, that's, my, <laughs> that's my main message. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. This is Priori Data. We help with a lot of stuff. Don't want to promote myself, but um, come and talk to me after, and uh, that's pretty much it. You can get a free account at our website. Do you have any questions? Is there any connection between uh, growing in uh, one app store, like Brazil, for example, and uh, getting promoted in another, or um, getting your increased chances to be a uh, top uh, rating in another? So there is a, a slight correlation only that you gain publicity by being ranked in the Google Play Store, for instance. So it's, a, it's, some of your, it, it's only effectively that you'd get more downloads, i.e. you'd get more users. Those users might be more likely to talk about your game. They would know people with an iPhone, and they would then go and download it. But it's two very separate ecosystems with separate taxonomies and separate logics, and they would rather that you de develop their, your game on, on, in their language, obviously, as well. I meant uh, by country, like oh. uh, sa uh, same ecosystem, different country. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Absolutely. There's a, there's a there's a there's an opportunity. Like, it, um, I mean, it makes sense. The Apple App Store and the Google Play Store are businesses that both companies are making a lot of money on, and they do favor games that are doing well. So, if your game is game is exploding in Brazil, the likelihood of getting a feature of a next update, etc., in another country is is insanely good. It's very difficult to get a feature as a first-time developer in the Apple App Store, for instance. You sort of need to have proven yourself. And, um, and so, yes, there's absolutely a synergy you can obtain that through. Uh, you do it for uh, another application or only for games? No, we do both, uh, both apps and games. Uh, you've titled your, to your talk as uh, making great games is not enough. Um, I was wondering, do you see the connection between the quality of the games and their success, or is it all just about the right data and uh, being at the right place at the right time? That, that's a really good question. No, I totally see a correlation between a quality game and, and success. So it, it, it's nothing like I think the, the key metric that everyone wants to navigate after is retention, right? How well do you retain your users? And you can't really retain your users through marketing. You can't compensate for a, in like a a poor product by doing more marketing and growth. But what I mean is that you have to invest in making the product grow in itself as well. You have to have a marketing component within the game to succeed. And I think you can only do that if you sort of combine your resources and not just build a great game from a gamer experience perspective, but also that, that allows people to share that experience with others and, um, and invite, like, facilitate growth within the game itself. Uh, but it's a good question, and it's not that good products are still like sought after. Nobody wants advertising everywhere. Thank you.